It's my pleasure to introduce Esther Sternberg, um, who will be talking about wearable health from molecules to environment. Esther is a professor of medicine and psychology, director of research at Andrew Wild Center for Integrative Medicine, director of the Institute of Place, Wellbeing, and Performance, inaugural Andrew Wild Endowed Chair for Research in Integrative Medicine. She is internationally recognized as a pioneer in design and health. We are very lucky to have you here at the University of Arizona. Um, her work with General Services Administration included using wearable and real-time devices that informed building, design, and operation standards for health. Previously, Dr. Sternberg was a senior scientist and section chief at NIH. She has authored more than 225 scholarly articles and two popular books, including one that I recently purchased, Healing Spaces, The Science of Place and Wellbeing. Dr. Sternberg is a frequent, frequently interviewed and invited to keynote. So welcome, Dr. Sternberg. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to kind of get in front of this podium here and talk about architects who are in the space. I'm not an architect. Um, I'm a physician, as you've heard. But I work closely with architects. And one of the big reasons I came to the University of Arizona is to uh, create the Institute on Place of well-being and performance, which formally links the College of Medicine, the Andrew Wild Center for Integrative Medicine. I'm sorry, can I get you aware of this? This is for the video recording. Oh. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not worried I'm not I have to have more. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I didn't have enough coffee to be wired enough, so I had to, no. Um, so I, um, we created this Institute on Place Wellbeing and Performance, formally linking the College of Medicine, the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine, and the College of Architecture Planning and Landscape Architecture, really to study the concept of health in much more than the biomedical model. The biomedical model basically talks about health as the absence of disease, but health is way more than the absence of disease, and the physical environment uh, is extremely important. Place shapes behaviors. I believe that Winston Churchill was the first person to use that phrase. Uh, we, I, and a number of others have added place shapes behaviors that are important for health. So to the extent that design professionals can work with health professionals, we are partners in the health of this nation. So how many of you are design professionals? Right, that makes sense. This is an architecture-driven uh, um, conference. So, so we are exposed to many, many stresses during the day. And cumulatively, those stresses are what we call allostatic load. So if you imagine that you wake up in the morning, you have an empty sack on your back, and every single stressful event you add into that sack. And by the end of the day, you are weighted down with this weight of stress. And that's what makes you sick. It's not the individual stressors, it's the cumulative stressors that make you sick. So there's tremendous evidence um, in the scientific and medical literature that shows that chronic stress, this allostatic load, predisposes to more severe and more frequent viral infections, lower take rate of vaccine. So if you're a caregiver of a loved one and you go out to get a vaccine, it's going to be less effective because your immune system is not able to do its job. Prolonged wound healing, speeding of chromosomal aging, and speeding of cancer growth. So stress doesn't cause these conditions. Stress makes them worse because it impairs the immune system's ability to fight infection and to fight disease and to repair. Because of the stress hormones, cortisol, that suppresses the immune system. So can we, can you, design spaces to reduce stress? So what I'm going to show you is uh, research that I've been doing for over, for the last about 20 years with the US General Services Administration. First when I was a senior scientist and section chief at the National Institutes of Health, and now in the last seven years since I've uh, come to the University of Arizona. So of course there are elements of place that can stress and elements of place that can calm. Loud noises, too much noise, too little noise. Too much light, too little light. Um, 
temperature, humidity, I'll show you some of this data, too much, too little is not good, and crowding, odors, mazes. Does that sound like any particular kind of building that you might have been in recently? <laughs> what, what? Oh, I know, <laughs> no, no, I'm not gonna name buildings on the campus, no. <laughs> No, no, hospitals, hospitals. The good news is that healthcare design is way ahead of many other aspects of uh, the design community. Uh, the rest are catching up, but to create hospitals that do not contain these stresses. But typically hospitals, in, when I was coming up through the system, were dark, smelly, noisy mazes and were very stressful. So the opposite, calming sounds, sounds of nature, sounds of music, diffuse light, circadian daylight, temperature, humidity that's optimal, views of nature, fragrances, and labyrinths are all calming. Labyrinths are patterns on the floor that you can walk on uh, that were originally, um, the monks in the 13th century used these as a walking meditation, so that's different from mazes. So this is the work that I've been doing since I came here with Kevin Kampscher, who's the Director of High Performance Federal Buildings for the U.S. General Services Administration. Uh, as I mentioned, we started this work when I was in a, at NIH, and he came to me and asked if there was a way that I could help him to develop or to, to design their over 370 million square feet of office spaces, over a million federal office workers, so basically the GSA uh, builds and operates all non-military federal buildings. So he wanted to know if he could build these and operate them to have the people in them be happy, healthy, and productive. And that's a, a novel concept, but I was very happy to help on that. So the idea that we have at the Institute on Place and Well-Being and Performance is that you carry around with you this column of exposures to many different environments, environmental uh, features, as I've mentioned, and as you can see on the slide, and they impact at every moment of the day as you walk through these spaces, as you move through these spaces, as you live in them, work in them, sleep in them, they impact many different aspects of health. Now the good news is that in this day and age, there are many new devices that are coming online every single day to measure environmental uh, attributes in real time, to measure many aspects of health, well-being, and performance in real time. And so the studies that we've been doing use these wearable and stationary devices to link human health outcomes with environmental impacts. So this was how Well Built for Well-Being worked. That's the name of the study we did with the General Services Administration in collaboration also with a company in the Bay Area, Aclima, who, who developed um, um, devices and methods, systems to measure uh, environmental attributes in real time. So we used wearable, uh, chest wearable, uh, heart rate variability monitors to measure the stress and relaxation response, posture, um, activity and sleep quality. Uh, we sent questions to the smartphone throughout the day to get subjective measures of how people were feeling. Um, and we had these uh, both stationary and wearable um, uh, devices to measure up to 11 different attributes of the environment. We published this paper a year ago uh, in August uh, in uh, um, in a journal, of one of the sister journals of the British Medical Journal, it garnered more press around the world than any other paper in that journal, and that at top 5% of any papers, because we found that people in open office settings, bench seating, were significantly more active, 32% uh, more active than people in private offices, and 20% more active than people in cubicles, and when they went home at night, they were 14% less stressed, the people who were more active. A lot of people hate their, their open office settings, and I'd be interested in this discussion to hear your feedback on this. But it turns out that open office settings are good for your health. At least when you look at activity, it amounts to uh, up to 1,000 steps more per day. Your office could be your new gym. This is a passive way of encouraging healthy activities. I speak to HR uh, um, uh, medical directors of Fortune 500 companies, and they complain that it's really hard to get people to go to the gym, to engage in healthy activities, maybe for three days after Thanksgiving. 
yes? <laughs> but then you stop. So if you can, design professionals can passively design the, the space so that people engage in these activities, that's a very important piece of maintaining health. We also ask people in the moment, on the smartphone, do you feel focused? When they were either in the cubicles, bench seating, or private offices, in the moment there was no difference. Now this is really important because people complain that they're not focused when, when they're in open office settings and they complain about moving from private offices into open office settings. When we asked them after the fact, they said they were more focused in the private offices, but in the moment they felt focused. We don't know why that is. It may have something to do with people's memory. Things stand out. You remember things more. We don't know. But it speaks to the importance of doing real-time um, uh, questionnaires in when you're doing pre-post occupancy studies to evaluate uh, the efficiency of your space. When we talk about open office settings, this is what we mean. This is from the GSA headquarters at 1800F in downtown Washington, D.C. It is not just a field of desks. It is many choices, many, many choices, so that you can be at your desk, you can work with colleagues in small clusters, you can have a private room, a, a phone room, or conference room, and so on. That's what we mean. Now, there may be situations in which you walk too much. This is a study that is ongoing now with the College of Nursing with Jessica Rainbow, one of our uh, junior faculty in the College of Nursing. Um, this is work from San Young John at the College of Engineering and S Systems and Industrial Engineering. We have the nurses in the old Banner Hospital cardiac step-down unit where um, devices, transmitters, and there were uh, receivers uh, as to track them throughout the, the space. And what you can see on, on your right, my left, is the movement of one nurse on the ward, the, the cardiac step-down unit. And when we superimpose that movement, you can see that that one particular nurse is moving back and forth to one particular area a lot. When you look at six of the nurses, and this is pilot data, this is ongoing now in the new hospital as well, but you can see that one nurse is moving a lot more than the others. This could be bad for health because it may induce foot pain, back pain, uh, difficulty sleeping, and so on. So one of the questions for design professionals is, can you design the space to even out the movement? That is an important piece, too. And in fact, the systems and industrial engineers, uh, San Young John and his team, can do that. They can take this kind of data and do predictive modeling to see how to better design the space in order to even out uh, the movements. What about the air you breathe? So as you're breathing out, everybody take a deep breath in and breathe out. Okay, we just injected a whole lot of carbon dioxide in the room. So hopefully the uh, ventilation system is good because what you can see here is that the more people there are for the longer period of time in a room where the ventilation is poor, the carbon dioxide increases. Now why is that important? Because it turns out that much lower levels of carbon dioxide than were previously thought and that are in actually the ASHRAE standards impair cognitive performance. At about 500 parts per million, you're at 100% cognitive performance. At uh, 900 parts per million, you're at 85% cognitive perform performance. At 1,500 parts per million, which is the top of the ASHRAE standards, uh, you are at 50% cognitive performance. So if you're falling asleep, it's not me, it's the ventilation system. <laughs> So one of the things we discovered in our study with the GSA is that we all carry around a personal carbon dioxide bubble. The levels of carbon dioxide in that bubble can be as high as 1,500 parts per million. So this is a problem. You could be rebreathing your carbon dioxide, falling asleep, impairing your cognitive performance and not realizing it, but it can be easily dissipated with a fan. So what about temperature and humidity? This paper was, again, from the GSA, Well Built for Wellbeing Study. We just published it last week. Uh, press release went out that got picked up across Arizona. It's not the heat, it's the humidity, right? We care about that here. How many people are from 
not from Arizona. Oh, okay, well then you know <laughs> it's not the heat, it's the humidity. Um, so it turns out, again, too much humidity is not good and too little humidity is not good. So the ASHRAE standards currently are, hum in, indoor uh, buildings should be between 30 and 60% relative humidity. Well, we found that when the, when the people were in a lower than 30% or higher than 60%, their stress response was increased. Now, we think that's because the body has to work more, the, the heart has to work more to compensate when you're not comfortable. But there's an optimal. So there's a difference, there's a 25% difference in the stress response. 25% day in, day out is a lot. It's a lot of cumulative stress. So again, to the extent that design professionals can remove that piece of stress from your daily living, you will contribute enormously to the health of the nation. We also found in this study that the, there was an optimal amount of relative humidity around the 45% level plus or minus 3%. Now it turns out in another study that was done quite separately from us, in a hospital study, they found that there was a much higher rate of uh, infections, of, of airborne infections, at a low relative humidity of 30%. So part of the reason for this stress may be that people are more prone to getting these infections because their mucous membranes are drying out. We found in this study as well that the people who were, were more stressed during the day had poorer sleep quality. That's obvious. You're stressed at work, you're going to sleep poorly. But if part of the reason for the stress at work is the physical environment, again, that's something that design professionals can fix. What about light? Uh, I'll just go through this quickly. This is our partners, our collaborators at uh, RPI, Mariana Figuero who has worked with the GSA for many years looking at circadian light. Circadian light is daylight, blue light, light in the morning. People who are exposed to lots of blue lights, uh, full spectrum sunlight in the morning, sleep better, fall asleep faster, and have less depressive moods than people who are exposed to, uh, who are not exposed to the daylight. So we are lucky here in uh, Arizona that we have a lot of snowbirds who come here and we're helping you with your sleep. Now when you're designing an office building and you want to have a lot of windows and a lot of uh, uh, light coming in, you also have to be aware that that light may not penetrate all the way in to where the people are working. We're going to hear more about that later from I think Omar and Altaf about design solutions for improving the daylighting. So there are many data-driven des design solutions and again we're in a wonderful era where the future is smart. We have the access to m many technologies that can help improve many of these uh, aspects of the built environment that are bad for health. This is an example from Mariana Figuero uh, looking at tailored interventions to promote uh, alertness with, again, blue light in the morning and red light in the evening when you don't have access to uh, full daylight. I took this picture at the Broad uh, Museum of Art in uh, Los Angeles because they have automated shades that, um, that protect from glare. I think we're going to hear more about glare a little later on. And this is Dr. Alethea Idas. Wonderful work, sitting in the back over there. Uh, she presented earlier this morning, using bioresponsive materials to uh, automatically create local environments for people with optimal temperature and humidity. That's going to be the solution in the future. Not trying to change the whole building one size fits all, but using technologies that will create local environments to optimize all these aspects of health. And why is this important? We spend 90% of our time indoors, $225 billion a year on workplace-related illnesses. And it turns out when studies have been done, this is from a hospital study, that if you spend more up front to design a better building, you recoup that expenditure in the first year of operation from all the health benefits and experience benefits from the people inside the building. 
The GSA is instantiating these uh, features into uh, their policies. You can go online to that GSA Sustainable Facilities tool where you'll find uh, the many aspects of the built environment that they recommend to improve health. Um, and I'll just end with this. Uh, this is of great interest across the federal government, the military, and this is IARPA. We have a project with the intelligence community uh, the, uh, in the office of uh, national, uh, the, the director of national intelligence. Um, to take these kinds of principles, these wearables, into learning more about how the built environment impacts health, well-being, and performance. So the new frontier, in my mind, is smart and adaptive design for all. So I think I will end there and turn it over to Kathy to introduce the next speakers. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, okay. Ricky, I have my instructions. <laughs> okay, we're very fortunate. The next speakers will be a dual group here. Um, Altef Engineer, who's an assistant professor at the School of Architecture and College of um, Architectural Planning and Landscape Architecture. Um, Altef Engineer is an assistant professor, as I said, and uh, is a research faculty member in the University of Arizona Institute for Place and Well-Being. Um, he serves as chair of the Masters of Science in Architecture Health and the Built Environment. He developed a new curriculum that aligns closely with his design, health, and well-being research and practice objectives. And Omar Youssef is also at the School of Architecture and in the sustainable built environments um, area. Um, he is a lecturer and a research associate in the Institute on Place, Wellbeing, and Performance. Um, Dr. Youssef teaches environmental control systems, sustainable architecture studio, and advanced computer simulation for thermal performance optimization of buildings. His research utilizes cutting edge technology to assess the impact of the built environment on human health and well-being. They will be speaking about a comparison of virtual reality versus real life experiences of labyrinths to test the validity and virtual reality simulations and their influence on human performance. Welcome and thank you for being here. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Altaf, and uh, this is Amar. Uh, Hello. We have one microphone, so we'll, we'll exchange it a bit. And this one's recording, so we're going to stand behind the podium uh, for this presentation. Um, as, uh, as Kathy mentioned, uh, the research study that uh, we are working on is uh, right now, and we're going to present is the comparison of virtual reality versus real world uh, labyrinth walking and uh, measuring stress responses and human performance um, in that activity. Uh, this, this presentation to me makes a lot of sense coming after uh, Wynn's presentation in the previous panel before lunch when he talked more about virtual reality and his holodeck project. And this is uh, one of the uh, you know, early pilot studies that has us thinking on this track of collaborations between uh, you know, technology, virtual reality, and the built environment. Uh, our questions are right on the screen, our research questions. Our primary one will be, uh, is uh, will a VR labyrinth reduce stress, will actually cause a reduction in stress versus a real world labyrinth uh, when, when walking the labyrinth? Uh, secondary questions are, are the associations between temperature, humidity, uh, and other environmental variables and stress responses in human beings. Um, and as Esther mentioned, glare, daylighting, these are all the factors that we want to consider when measuring uh, these stress responses. Uh, and the last one is, is VR an effective tool in pre-occupancy evaluation of built environments? So increasingly, uh, the field of pre-occupancy, uh, we think, is gaining a lot of traction. And it also makes a lot of sense. Like if you already built something, uh, spending millions of dollars, and then you spend 
another millions of dollars fixing it because it doesn't work. You know, that, that process to us doesn't make any sense when we now have the means to measure before that process, right, and do pre-design, pre-occupancy evaluations. So um, here's, here's an introduction to our team, which uh, right now is myself, Omar, and Dr. Sternberg. Uh, and we are hoping to build, we have this project, more collaborations across the university, uh, such as, you know, WINS projects and uh, other colleagues from digital technologies and humanities as we move forward. So just to clarify, and Ashtar mentioned this briefly, like a labyrinth is not a maze, right? And sometimes these two terms are used uh, interchangeably, but that's actually wrong. A maze actually confounds and confuses you and causes a lot of stress when you're walking through it. But a labyrinth is a tool for therapy. It's a form of meditation. There's only one path as shown as uh, in the image from the outside. Sorry, which screen is that point? Maybe this one. From the outside towards the center, there's only one path. And you're supposed to walk it slowly and think about questions about your life, etc. cetera. Uh, it's set to improve focus as you slowly walk towards the center. And then as you slowly walk outwards, you think of solutions to those questions, right? So it's a tool of therapy, and there's already a lot of research uh, on the labyrinth walking and the phenomenon of stress reduction and the use of it as a therapeutic tool. <coughs> One of the studies uh, that was done in 19, uh, 2010 uh, that resonates very closely with uh, our project is uh, the one that's shown up front there, uh, labyrinth walking in, correction in correctional facilities. Um, it was a short pilot study of 14 uh, prisoners in the facility, and they made them walk a labyrinth and measured health responses. They did a survey, uh, so self-reporting information, as well as measure their blood pressure before and after. So from the survey and the measurements, they found significant improvements in health. So the blood pressure readings were actually significantly better in most of the prisoners. And, you know, so, and in correctional facilities, you know, the priority is to reduce violent incidents and crime and use, uh, you know, therapy tools. So this is, you know, really useful and relevant for them as well. So part of the initiative that we um, started with is actually identifying a series of labyrinths that are available to us here in Tucson. And Altaf and I went to visit um, quite a few number to identify what's actually um, one of the labyrinths that do fall within the criteria of what a labyrinth is. Because we found out that a lot of them aren't really a labyrinth. They kind of look like a labyrinth, but they're not really a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. So we started to initiate this pilot study using some of our resources and our knowledge um, just to investigate our own and to identify that kind of like fine-tune our research question. So we went to a um, we went to a labyrinth and we started record recording using drones. We did 360 cameras, we did still cameras, the still photography, we did heart rate monitoring. So we basically used as much technology as we can as architects to evaluate what is the equipment that's available to us. What can we use to investigate areas of the built environment and make them useful to identify and understand how we're designing the built environment. So part of the things that we did, so this is, here's me in the picture, I was wearing a heart rate monitor, walking within the labyrinth and recording um, the experience. We did this with me, Altaf, and a series of other um, research investigators. So the goal was to identify our own experience compared to um, the research that has been validated compared to publications and really get that experience to us personally to understand so that we're not just basic on um, evidence and data that's been uh, pre-done, but our own human experience was a key part of our study. <clears throat> so some of the criteria that we wanted to assess is actually to look at, as architects, what's the material that's made within the labyrinth? What kind of climate conditions exist within this environment? What kind of nature that surrounds this environment? What do you hear? What do you see as you walk? And to kind of capture a holistic and full experience of the space, and not just to look at it as a labyrinth that we, you just walk into, but we're trying to capture a lot of the climatic data, understand the material, the field of view, how a person is standing inside the space, and how can we analyze that space from a human perspective. So the, the two hypotheses for the study, uh, the first one is we do expect a reduction in stress from the virtual reality uh, walking experience of a labyrinth, just as, as the real world. 
Uh, additionally, we, we also expect to find reduced stress uh, within less disturbing and secluded locations within the labyrinth. So the labyrinth we studied was outside. And then we get different views as we walk towards the center, and there's different glare conditions, and as we mentioned, you know, that affects stress responses. Uh, so we expect to find different readings as you're walking even inside the labyrinth. And in comparison to cityscape uh, walking lots and parkways, we also expect to find a stress reduction uh, by, the, by the labyrinth walking exercise. So in the walking exercise, actually, we are going to purposely make the participants walk through a parking lot and then into a labyrinth so that we can see a reduction in stress when, when that happens. So again, investigating that criteria being within cityscapes, we started looking around our immediate environment, looking at the buildings that surround campus and investigating the experience within those spaces as we're comparing the relationship of a labyrinth. Um, part of this investigation is to really see how the technology can help us understand the performance of people. So using wearable technology, now we're able to assess the heart rate uh, variability. We're able to see uh, reduction in blood pressure, looking at stress responses, um, together with the help of um, uh, our, our, our physician slash architects. I feel uh, awkward calling you just physicians, being so involved, I mean, talking about ASHRAE. Uh, but, but looking at these and, and trying to understand what that really means. And again, the goal is not just to look at what is a labyrinth and how does it really play a role, but to investigate the tools that we can now have access to, right? Looking at the, all of these technologies that are available and how they could be useful to see what the cityscapes or labyrinths, or what are the criteria that we design and how can they have an impact on stress reduction. So this was part of our uh, GPS tracker walking within the labyrinth. As um, Altaf was saying, you can see that we uh, walk through this from the parking lot towards where the labyrinth is. This is one of the routes going through the labyrinth and then walking back out to the parking lot. So that you really feel that reduction in uh, and, and stress as soon as you cross from our dark pavement and asphalt parking lot into a more nature-infused environment. Uh, so we also have uh, long-term goals in addition to the short term about uh, you know, improving human health and uh, stress reduction. We want to understand how different types of uh, built environments can affect human performance, physiology, health, and well-being by using a variety of different non-invasive wearable devices. And, um, and this, in many aspects, also our big agenda at IPWP uh, of testing, trying and testing these various non-invasive devices. Uh, because it's, it's relatively easier uh, with the new technology now to measure physiology versus uh, collecting saliva and blood in every case. And uh, you know these invasive processes can also scare people off from participating in these programs. So uh, we also want to understand how these tools can be used effectively in different types of built environments. And then a virtual reality in particular can be an effective tool in testing uh, these built environments, doing a pre-design, pre-occupancy analysis for these various types of built environments. So we, we also in the process got, I think, a little bit greedy too thinking about, well, I mean, just kind of sidetracking from what we're doing, look about virtual reality. But what if with the accessibility of virtual reality that we're able to create some sort of app or some sort of now using all of this technology, trying to return it back to um, the users and accessibility, and people who don't have the ability to actually go out and visit or walk through a labyrinth. So what if we create some sort of app where you're able to select any kind of labyrinth in the world um, just from your smartphone and then use that as a part of the um, integration with virtual reality to get the stress reduction experience. So that would be in your hands where you don't really have to just go out. So we kind of bring the natural environment, bring the architecture that we feel is, um, is helpful to the people that's inclusive to our environment, actually return it back to the people. So not just have them come and experience our spaces, but actually deliver it back to them. So again, with the simplicity, all you need to do is just use your phone as part of this app. You plug it into a virtual reality headset. These virtual reality headsets now are as cheap as $1 for the headset, so they're not really something that's requiring technology. All you need to do is just put it from your phone. But to, we need to first investigate how much of that 
virtual reality experience is really a, a effective in comparison to the actual um, environment. Thank you very much. This is, uh, this is all we have today, but I, we're going to take questions at the end. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, thank, you. thank you. Um, next speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ewan McLeod. He's an assistant professor in the College of Optical Sciences and the Bio5 Institute and an affiliate member of the U of A Cancer Center. His background and interests lie in the intersection of optics, nanoscience, environmental sensing, and soft biomaterial science. He has published more than 30 papers. His current projects include the design and assembly of nanophotonic structures, nanoscale imaging using lens-free holographic, on-chip microscopy, and optical biosensing. His uh, title is Optical Solutions for Widely Deployable Environmental Particulate Sensors. Thank you for the introduction. I think it looks like it's... I saw it coming up there. We have to resize it on here. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Okay, yes, so uh, I'm an assistant professor in optical sciences. So optical sciences is something that's a little bit unique about the University of Arizona. I'll come up in front of this too. Um, there are only three universities in the US that, that offer basically degrees in optics. Um, so there's University of Arizona, there's Rochester, University of Rochester, and University of Central Florida. So it's a little bit of a unique opportunity that we have here. Um, so in, this, in the College of Optical Sciences here, there are a lot of faculty members who do research in kind of the more scientific side of things and very physics-y type work. There's a lot of people who do a lot more engineering type work. Um, so I'm kind of in that, that boundary between those two. Uh, a lot of what I work on has to do with sensing um, and that, that's kind of the application here. So in my research group, we, we do kind of three different things. One is this lens-free holographic imaging. That's mostly what I'm going to be talking about today. And we use this as a sensor. Um, and so we're interested in sensing things like air quality. Um, we're also interested in doing things like biomedical sensing um, for different types of biological targets um, that might be disease pathogens or these sorts of things. Um, we also do 3D nanofabrication using optical tweezers. That's maybe a little bit less interest um, to this community. And then the last is a lot of design and simulation and modeling. And some of that um, goes back in to uh, basically designing and simulating new types of sensors. So nanophotonics is basically the interaction of light with nanomaterials, so that's my, my particular area. Um, so optics is the study of light, and so in our case, um, we're interested in how does light interact with things that are much smaller than the wavelength of the light, and that leads to a lot of new physics, but also a lot of new um, engineering opportunities. So today I'm just going to talk really about this, this first part for the most part. Um, so before we get into that, some acknowledgments. So I have a, a t team of great students um, working with me, including um, graduate students, PhD students, master students, um, and, and undergraduates. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today was a work that was done by an undergrad um, in my group. Isaiah Engel is that, that last student there. Uh, and then th there are a lot of interesting um, collaborations that are relevant to here. So um, we collaborate with Judith Sue's group, and she's in biomedical engineering and optical sciences, um, Manny Katsanis in pediatrics. Um, Sadhana Ravashankar in CALS who does food safety, so that's another kind of sensor application. Um, and then recently as a result of this um, Restruct Symposium, um, we've, I've started working with Mary Kay O'Rourke and Chuck Gerba um, for doing some more indoor air quality sensing um, type applications. So one of the main targets um, that I think the, the, a lot of people are interested in is uh, air quality. So um, air quality is actively monitored throughout the world. So you can go on to this website, waqi.info, um, and you can find air quality in pretty much any city throughout the world. Um, this is an example from Tucson. So this was from a couple months ago. Um, this just happened to be the, the date I chose at the time I was making this presentation. And you can see that basically there, um, there aren't too many air quality stations around Tucson. So if you want to get um, very local variation, there isn't really enough. There's a Pima County air quality um, website that's a little bit different that maybe has about twice as many stations as this, but there still aren't, aren't too many stations. So it's kind of insufficient to capture local variations. Um, one of the key uh, air pollutants that's measured is this thing called PM 2.5. So PM stands for particulate matter, and 2.5 is just the size of the particulate matter. So what they're doing is they're measuring all the particles that are floating around in the air, where the size of the particle, the, the diameter of that particle is less than 2.5 microns. So um, 10, micron is like a 10 to the minus 6 meter. Um, so it's one millionth of a meter. Um, and so the particles that are this size or smaller are one of the major health hazards. Um, so a lot of times the two most quoted um, measures of air quality will be the PM 2.5 level, and then also the ozone level is, is also sometimes a problem too. 
So on this example, you can see that even here in Tucson on this particular day, this was um, the day I was preparing an, an another talk, there was one station here in Flowing Wells that was um, considered unhealthy for sensitive groups, so it had this kind of orange rating. And so even here locally, where you think that um, air quality should be very, very good in Tucson, you can find local variations um, in air quality, and some places are, are not so healthy. And then also indoors, there's a wide variety. Like if you, um, as, as Esther was talking about in the first presentation, if you go from you know, a conference room to an open air office, there's a big variety here. If you look at other places throughout the world, so let's say you look at China, um, then the, things can be much worse. So China and India are the two places people talk about a lot in terms of, of air quality becoming a major, major problem. And you can see that there are many places here that are basically very unhealthy or, or hazardous um, for pretty much anyone who goes outside. And so you see all these photos of people wearing masks and so on. So one of the things I want to talk about today is, is what's called ultrafine particulate matter. And so this is another size scale below PM2.5. So PM2.5 is what is one of those major indices that's measured, and that's 2.5 microns. If you go um, 25 times smaller than that, you get to 100 nanometers. And in that case, you're measuring this what's called ultrafine particulate matter. So PM2.5 is fine particulate matter. Ultrafine is below 100 nanometers. And this is something that um, kind of very recently is starting to become much, uh, much more of a health concern. So so this is one example from um, Science Magazine here that basically says evidence builds that dirty air causes Alzheimer's and dementia. And in, in particular, it's talking about these ultrafine particles. So it says these, these particles are too fine for many air pollution sensors to actually accurately measure. Um, and when it comes to toxicity, size matters. And so basically what this is saying is that if you're comparing the toxicity levels for these fine particulates versus the ultrafine particulates, um, there's basically different thresholds for what's safe, what's safe to go out to be and exposed for. So these are two examples from the um, NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational um, Safety and Health Guidelines. And so one example is carbon, basically. So at the, at the fine particulate stage, this is typically called carbon black. And so you can imagine this would be kind of like soot that might come from some sort of industrial process. Uh, so at the fine particulate um, level, the, the safety threshold is 3,500 micrograms per cubic meter. And then at the ultrafine level, it's one microgram per cubic meter. So there's a much more stringent state safety threshold for these ultrafine particulates. And that same sort of thing happens for titanium dioxide there too. So that's another example. So what do we have to do with this? So one of the things that we do in our group um, is we work on developing new types of sensors. And optics is a great way of trying to sense things that are particularly small and trying to sense things very sensitively. Uh, and so one of the technologies we use is this lens-free holographic microscopy. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of break that down. So if you think of a, a normal way of if you want to look at something small, you would look at it through a microscope. So you'd put this in your microscope, and your microscope might cost you know, tens of thousands of dollars, and it's a very big, bulky piece of equipment. So we're trying to solve some of those problems associated with that and try to make something that's kind of a lot more portable, more distributable, easier to use, much uh, less expensive. And so what, what we do here is we just have a light source um, that's at the top there. We have our sample with whatever we want to image um, and that's transparent. And then we just put it on top of an image sensor chip. And so that image sensor chip is basically the same sort of chip that you'd get in a cell phone camera. Um, it's just stripped of all the, the cell phone part, stripped of the lens in front, all these sorts of things. So it's just a, an image sensor chip. So this tends to be very, um, very inexpensive. Um, and what we record is we record the pattern the light creates as it passes through these objects. So you can kind of think of it as a shadow, but it's a little bit more complicated than just a shadow because we've encoded a lot of um, information about the particles into that shadow, much more than you'd see from a normal shadow. So uh, one of the things we're using, using this to do is to try to sense these ultrafine um, particles. So we can sense um, particles basically as small as 40 nanometers. Um, we can see a very large area. So although th this whole system doesn't look very large, if you think in terms of microscopes, it's actually a very large field of view. So our field of view is that full sensor chip compared to that little kind of red rectangle in the, in the middle um, for a normal microscope. And then it's also pretty inexpensive. So this is an example of a, of a type of image we might get from a very small region um, uh, of our microscope. And what we do is we use some computational techniques to basically reconstruct that diffraction pattern or that kind of complex shadow into being able to see the objects on our, on our sample. Um, and so we can basically resolve these individual particles after doing this computational processing. So one of the challenges, of course, is we want to be able to sense these really small ultrafine particles. And one of those challenges is that the small particles tend to look like background noise. So one of the things that we've done to try to um, improve our sensitivity here is combine this technique with a very thin liquid film. And so this liquid film is only maybe about 10, 10 nanometers thick. And whenever it encounters some sort of particulate matter, um, you get this little meniscus. And you can kind of see those blue lines on the left there. And that would be the meniscus of this liquid film. So it's a liquid polymer that we're using. And this actually helps us boost our sensitivity and detect these very small particles. We have a fairly good understanding of the, the physics behind why this works for us. 
Um, and then we can also use this basically as a calibration curve to, to create a device, to create a sensor that's going to be able to sense these particles and count the number and be able to size them um, automatically. So this is how we, we've been doing it in the past. We take these particles, um, we somehow capture them on a surface. So it could be they just kind of float down from the air. It could be they are flowed through some liquid sample, um, depending on what we want to look for. We then take our sample, we expose it to a vapor of this, this liquid. And in this case, it's this liquid um, polyethylene glycol. And then that forms that little nanoscale film that's going to help us detect these small particles. And then we put it on one of these um, kind of benchtop lens-free holographic microscopes. So where we want to go, um, so we've kind of demonstrated very good sensitivity to small particles here, is we, we basically want um, to do some more research into, into nanofilm effects to basically be able to sense smaller particles and also to be able to do this in real time. So one of the challenges on the, on the previous slide is we have to capture all our particles first. We then coat it with this liquid film and then we sense it. So one of the things we want to do is we want to be able to kind of sense these particles as they're landing in real time. Um, we want to kind of have an improved port portable device. So this lens-free holographic microscopy lends itself to being packaged in these small portable devices. And um, this is one thing that, that we haven't done yet but shouldn't be too challenging. We want to be able to kind of reduce costs. So currently the cost of all our materials that go into one of these is a few hundred dollars. We think we can get it under a hundred dollars. We want to integrate some air handling, some airflow. Um, we want to do some laboratory and field testing. And then another area that we're working on is um, aqueous biosensing. And so in this case, it's not going to be air quality sensing, but there are a lot of other kind of sensing targets that are, are of interest to us for, say, disease sensing or maybe food safety sensing, these sorts of things that, that are um, held in some sort of aqueous matrix. And so in this case, we have some areas where we're looking at combining um, this lens-free microscopy with some microfluidics. Um, and so I have one student who's done a lot of work on this so far. And this microfluidics basically consists of little microscale beads that have been functionalized with capture agents to capture some particular target. So if we know kind of what biological molecule or maybe what bacteria we're wanting to sense, we can capture that and then um, sense it and count it. Um, and so there, there are a variety of other sensing technologies we, we use too, um, in addition to these, but this kind of gives you a flavor of the sort of stuff we do. And I think it's something that could be relevant for this community because you could imagine having a lot of these, these sensors that are kind of widely deployable, very inexpensive, and can be um, kind of used to measure these ultra-fine particulates or some more advanced targets. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. So, okay, great. Lots of technology. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Altaf mentioned the holodeck. Um, this is an image that we sent to NSF in 2015 and got an award to build a, a holodeck. A holodeck uh, as is um, initially described in the Star Trek series as a room that individuals can go into and it creates a mixed reality environment um, that is possible to use for entertainment or problem solving or uh, inter, um, interpersonal collaboration. Uh, so we said that with a new type of instrument like a microscope or telescope, we could do a new kind of social science that if we had a holodeck that fused existing and emerging technologies, that we'd start to have the kind of instrument that could both create new environments, but then also study the participants in those environments. So we're very excited um, to um, have the opportunity to work with the uh, Bio Institute Bio5 closed-loop sensor lab and the investigators in that initiative and the 
previous speakers um, and uh, across the university to create this kind of uh, institutional resource that can be used in many different domains. So um, that's uh, the image that's on the first slide here. Um, today I'd like to share with you a series of projects that led us to this initiative, you know, to this initiative and um, share with you the participatory and co-design activities that have been based in health, uh, particularly my work in relational agents and how interactions with technologies that are personalized and contextualized can be beneficial to individuals in diverse settings. And then finally explore some areas of extreme environments that um, are also exciting to look at. So uh, a little bit of more about my background. I started um, some work very early on with the World Scout Bureau and UNICEF on healthy lifestyles for youth, uh, designing merit badges and um, uh, topics on responsible sexual behavior and um, uh, assist, um, substance abuse. Uh, I worked with IDEO uh, and their Open IDEO uh, initiative, which is uh, essentially you know, one of the, the progenitors of sort of modern design thinking, thinking about how we can use these kind of transdisciplinary collaborative approaches to tackle wicked challenges. Um, and so I'll get to that in a, a moment. At IBM, I was working on projects ranging from MedSpeak, which was using how, learning how we could use um, in radiology technologies that could be held in a hand, um, using voice uh, natural language processing in real time, because uh, there would be several days before you'd get your responses from your radiological. So by putting all this technology, the mouse, the cursor, the barcode scanner, and the microphone into one handheld device, you could start to get uh, turnaround times in under an hour, and, and in some settings that's particularly important. So um, went from there to the Media Lab at MIT, um, and I'll share with you some of those projects. At, at, there I got to collaborate with Harvard Business School and uh, Teresa Mobile, who looked at creativity and the way the built environment affects creativity. So looking at how individuals get up and move and speak to one another throughout a day and over time can look at how to predict uh, their creative behavior. Um, and sort of fundamentally, I believe in this uh, idea of democratizing innovation. How can we create toolkits around our knowledge and use those toolkits to share with each other the resources and, and opportunities that we have? So the vision for the holodeck is that it's a shared toolkit. Um, every toolkit should have ambassadors and, uh, and access, passive and active media for access. Uh, so individuals like in our data science program here at U of A, um, you can go to the data science ambassadors and learn from the ground up, not knowing anything about data science, starting to get access and pathways to data science. So if you have those kinds of uh, opportunities across disciplines, then you can start to create the cross-pollination um, that, that we want to see. Um, this was a project early on at the Media Lab, um, and I think this image uh, in the, well, so it's a container that was put uh, in collaboration with the government of Costa Rica in rural settings, and Costa Rica has uh, a system of healthcare pro providers in which every community has a key point person. Uh, and so we were experimenting what could a shipping container do with a number of computers. So if you look here, there's a educational suite, uh, there's a um, infrastructure for mail and uh, government kind of processing kind of things and then there's a uh, health suite so initial healthcare clinic kind of uh, system and then the outside can be used for community events ranging from education like literacy and uh, projecting uh, reading and, and um, educational materials on the side of the panel and then um, and then also entertainment and community development so this was an early experiment in that context uh, a sort of related experiment which um, Use the built environment, or the byproduct of the built environment, a byproduct of the built environment, was to envision for the three uh, to four million children that die due to temperature regulatory control in their earliest days. Could we build an infant incubator that was made out of car parts? So anybody with the technology or uh, ability to repair a car could potentially repair the incubator. So the concern was that. If you buy a very expensive incubator, you may be able to use it in your hospital setting in a rural environment, but when it breaks, you don't have the capacity to get that repaired. Whereas if you change and invert the technology, potentially anybody 
um, with an instruction set could maybe build this in infant incubator um, you know, using uh, an automotive junkyard or, or that kind of approach. So this was a distributed uh, collaborative design across a number of universities with an organization called Design That Matters. And Design That Matters was set up to tackle these kinds of challenges that they would design and distribute to innovators. Currently, um, Design That Matters, probably one of their most successful projects is the Firefly Infant um, jaundice therapy or uh, phototherapy device. And so a lot of uh, lessons like making the bassinet small enough for an individual uh, because um, when you don't, you have a clustering of individuals and nobody gets a sufficient amount of treatment. And so these kinds of design parameters in context. Um, at ASU, I was at ASU for eight years prior to joining NYU uh, in the College of Nursing. I was part of this arts media engineering program, and one of the main projects that art media engineering took on was the synthesis of um, the, the range of these disciplines, um, dance, um, en electrical engineering, uh, psychology, uh, elect um, computer science, to tackle the challenges of stroke rehabilitation. And so if you can create an object that can be sensitive to the grasp and position of a person, and you can create a motivational environment, the kind of gaming or like paddling a, a, a canoe or reaching for a cup of coffee, uh, and give enough feedback, both in, multi, in, in, in multimodal feedback. So the thinking here was that uh, because of the stroke, there may be encumbrances and disabilities in certain channels. If you can have a synthesis of diverse channels, uh, ranging from the motion and action to the sonification, uh, to the electrical impulses that are being um, taken from your musculature as you're attempting to uh, do something, all of that could potentially make a better uh, response to the stroke therapy. So um, just want to advocate with this model the kinds of transdisciplinary collaborations that a symposium like this one is, is advancing and the kinds of things that with the holodeck we're interested in collaborating across the institution. Um, I mentioned Open IDEO and in 2014 when the um, Ebola crisis broke out at that time, the USAID said, well, let's use open IDEO to have grand scale challenges and, in, um, and let's um, fund you know, the winning challenges. Um, the problem with that is that while you may get a number of great ideas, crowdsourcing ideas, uh, you don't necessarily have the infrastructure to take those ideas to impact. And so by creating at an institution like a university, the, a infrastructure that can span the different disciplines that it takes to take a great idea uh, all the way to impact, um, you can start to have uh, you know, those pathways to realize the outcomes that you want to have. Um, the second theme I'd like to talk about is relational agents. And part of my thesis was to look at the social relational impact of a non of a of a learning companion. So this was presented as a non uh, as a agent that would mirror your interactions in real time and try and support your learning. Um, the reason uh, you know so so that it was originally for learning, but it, it's applicable to a lot of different uh, contexts. So the types of sensors we used ranged from the camera, the facial expression, the chair, skin conductance, uh, mouse. We took all of this together and we were able to create real-time nonverbal mirroring. So if you lean back, the character will lean back. If you uh, squeeze the mouse, the character will agitate. And so over, uh, you don't want to do it in real time uh, immediately because then it's mirroring and awkward, it's creepy. Uh, but if you do it uh, four seconds lagged, it's 99%, um, 100% of individuals don't recognize it and it creates a social bond, much as the one we have with one another when we're in our normal interactions. So um, in the interest of time, I won't show that video, but the, another application for that is uh, in terms of the healthcare setting, looking at an agent that will be with you throughout the course of your health concerns. So an agent that may start with you at your, when you leave a doctor's uh, uh, healthcare provider's um, office and you might start to log how you're feeling, you get a baseline at home before an operation or an, uh, or an intervention. Um, during the intervention, uh, you have this nurse buddy here. It's the same character, it's tracking, it understands what you've gone through, it knows how much you've slept today, what you've eaten today, when you need medications, how long it's gonna be till your next ability to get some more morphine. 
um, you know, all of these different elements. And then furthermore, it goes home and discharges you. So it has that full amount of inf information. It's backed up by the healthcare team. So the healthcare team can see your interactions with it and your questions. Uh, there are ways around it so you can get directly to healthcare team. Um, but if you're not uh, you know, taking the certain amounts of medicines or different things, it can actually uh, suggest that you call or in certain cases have them call you, uh, you know, to, to start to look at the compliance and uh, opportunities there. So um, furthermore, looking at smart environments and again, toolkits. How do end users begin to be able to take the kinds of smart environments that we see today and push them into the social, emotional, psychological, uh, creative endeavors? So we've created um, sensor suites that end users can install in their own homes and use for their own purposes. So we've had uh, recent graduates of college with no programming background be able to uh, program these environments. One of them wanted to learn guitar on their, uh, you know, um, because they'd moved away from their partner. And um, so she had the song that she wanted to learn play in the morning when she went to the kitchen and when she came home through the front door in the afternoon, a light shined on her guitar. And as she um, picked up the guitar, a YouTube channel would open um, with an optional posting. So after her session, she could choose yes or no, and then get all the social feedback that she was looking for to sustain and motivate that activity. So all of that was, that was a co-design. We've shown that people can design similar con, uh, similarly complex environments on their own in a laboratory environment. Uh, we haven't put it all together in terms of us being able to give you a kit right now to do that, but that's kind of the commercialization of the two to three different science things. We've also done uh, theses on, um, on sleep hygiene. So how can a group of individuals think about those kinds of interventions? Can you degrade your technology, make sure it doesn't work after 10 p.m., uh, make the, the TV turn into snow, uh, make the oasis uh, in the bedroom come alive and invite you to that environment? Um, and so these are ways, and, and then have that slow down and put you to sleep over a half hour period. Um, you know, similar sort of micro versions of this are the wake up alarm clock, the sun shining in your, you know. So looking at what do people want to do, how do they want to do it, giving them control, enabling this as part of the um, process of both the human computer interaction and societal understanding of what people want to do with technology, but also how technology can play roles in our lives. A very important one that we've done is um, a dress system that invites an individual to a dresser when they no longer remember how to get dressed. And this is a very challenging context for families and professional caregivers because people don't want to dress in front of other people when they have dementia and can't remember how to do it. Um, so, no, I don't want to. Get out of here. I'm getting dressed. Right? And um, that both means that I'm not going to have a good day because I just had to say all that. And the person I'm talking doesn't want to interact with me or support me anymore, even though that's their job or they're my family and they love me enough to do that for the rest of my life. But this is one of the hardest parts of our day and the hardest parts of our experience. So we were looking at the same kind of toolkit that was used for the guitar to create those interventions and provide the remote caregiver with uh, a, an automated um, remote uh, ability to support the dressing process. Uh, sometimes, potentially, eventually, we can get to fully automated, um, depending on the stage. One day that won't work for an individual anymore. Um, they will actually no longer be able to. But this can also track the progression. So, you know, this month, this half year, I might be able to do this. I might, it might be moving from five to 10 minutes to 15 to 20 minutes, and that still gives respite for my caregivers and loved ones. But, um, you know, after that, it may be time to look at a, either a more comprehensive smart environment, more human-based support. Um, I think what's particularly interesting about this one is, you know, it's not the trade-off of the human support. There is still the human in the environment, but this is a time in which I don't want the human to support me, and I will fight the human supporting me. So I would prefer, even if the technology has a little bit of invasivity, and in that context we're using cameras that are infrared based, so they're not looking at um, uh, visual presentation, but they do have representation. So you have all these interesting ethic challenges, and in a university you have IRB challenges because you are using cameras with individuals that aren't wearing any clothes. Um, so, uh, looking at how these get appropriated in diverse parts of everyday life is part of it. Again, a collaboration with IDEO. Uh, this is a creativity study looking at if you're wearing something as simple as your phone, so um, you know, a pendant or that kind of technology, um, we showed over a two-week period that when you get up and meet people face-to-face, 
you have the highest days of creativity. Um, so as people do that, you don't have to see everybody. The graph on the right here shows that just seeing one or two other people can predict the highest days of creativity in a small team for the individuals that participate in that. So the next step would be, can you motivate that? Hey, there's a little meeting between two people at the water cooler, uh, you know, and, and we have this um, you know, intrinsically motivated topic you can talk about. How's this? You know, how's, you know, how's your design of the dresser going? Uh, you know, so that can potentially lead to an intervention that can stimulate creativity. Um, looking at teams in distributed context, these people are trying to learn how to resuscitate and keep somebody alive. Um, we looked at how to do that in a distributed setting, similar to the labyrinth. What's the role of the virtual labyrinth, which is maybe much more accessible. This might be the labyrinth for me. I might walk to the end of the room and around it, uh, whereas, um, uh, I might not be able to get across town to, or I might not even know which of the right labyrinths to use. Many of them apparently aren't quite labyrinths. So, um, uh, and then just finally, uh, extreme environments. So uh, thinking about the hollow deck and uh, a precursor we got to use at ASU was the decision theater. How do you manage all this data and make uh, some form of interpretation, hopefully with end users, uh, about the kinds of lives and situations they want to lead with all this data. Um, we taught classes uh, in this environment with 50 undergraduates trying to understand how to go back to the lunar surface and what kind of science the return for resource investment they could potentially get. And we said, we want you to give us a mission at the end of the semester. We're not going to teach you anything else during this class other than give you that opportunity. Um, so there's literally two lectures, one on science and one on imagination slash engineering. And uh, the rest of the time, we had opportunities to go into this room uh, to work with assets across NASA and MIT uh, to use virtual reality and visualization. Um, Honeywell said this is one of the two classes, this and um, the one-year capstone master's level design of an aircraft. Uh, that we want to see ASU do more and more of. Um, so um, this had also been taught as a large-scale collaborative uh, class in, uh, on different topics, on Amazonia, on ANWR, on the uh, Galapagos at uh, MIT, and was written up in science as a novel way to teach. At MIT, it was taught with freshmen. 60, 10% of the freshman court class was involved in this. Uh, and then their second semester, they got to go out to some of these environments and explore how their solutions were, were working. Um, so with the holodeck and uh, these kinds of rich environments and toolkits, each of these represent a different type of toolkit that is agglomerated into a whole, which is the vision of the, you know, um, of the, of the holodeck. How can we use all the core facilities of the university, uh, the genetic sequencers, the telescopes, the, the architecture uh, in, uh, intelligence to uh, understand these and, and fuse them into uh, convergent science? Um, here's another extreme environment. How can we go into uh, new underwater environments, built environments underwater? Uh, you know, so we have a patent on the uh, portable habitat that can be used as a next generation science station, looking at the kinds of um, uh, studies and collaborations that occur across different environments. And then at, at U of A, we are advancing collaborations with Aztec, which is the Arizona Simulation Technology Education Center. And they have a large scale theater, similar to Decision Theater, but much bigger and, and, and more specific to healthcare, where we can explore uh, complex challenges such as the ones we were talking this morning, what's the relationship of the built environment of the hospital and the patient care settings all the way up to um, the atmospherics and the wildfires or cyclones or um, you know Katrina or Harvey or Irma events that are occurring and can we do that iteratively in real time across settings um, to, uh, to advance this kind of agenda. So uh, Barbara introduced me to Zubin Zhang, and Zubin and I and Andrew Hamilton, who's leading this, along with Nirav Merchant um, of the Data Science Center and Eric Lyons he brought along, a couple other individuals, said this is a topic that we want to have a workshop over a three to six month period and go after a series of large scale grants. So could we do you know, 10 grants over two and a half years uh, at the you know, million to multi-million dollar levels to um, advance kind of, uh, you know, something that no university is really doing at that scale. Um, so uh, again, just, uh, we've talked enough about this, but uh, just to elucidate a little, the image was that a, an, a scientist, a biochemist on the right would collaborate with a social agent, a robot, a relational agent to, uh, 
you know, um, to collaborate on the sequence of a DNA strand, uh, while on the right, a musician would be able to collaborate on the xylophonic properties of the, of the st strand, uh, their own interpretation of this science and, the, and its art form. And so, you know, that's a piece of what we're doing with the holodeck. We're, you know, trying to reach out across the university, uh, you know, th with, through my position with the School of Information and Health Science Design to really engage uh, in, in uh, the many, many different topics that we can, that can benefit from uh, having this kind of advanced visualization and advanced sensing environment. Um, just real quick, it's a visual, uh, physical, uh, physiological, and then data-centric uh, approach to, uh, and with uh, large-scale collaborations um, to realizing uh, a new type of instrument or science that um, essentially is an engine for convergence science. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and now for something different. Okay, we started with small particles and now we're going to big. And the other thing we're going to is something that we seem to ignore with all our techs, uh, technology, and that is the stress that people cause on themselves just by the teams that are put together in, in various experiments. So this is Biosphere uh, 2. Uh, it's called Biosphere 2, and, and the reason that I, uh, that I appreciate the present, uh, getting a chance to present this is that at the moment, Biosphere 2 is a scientific instrument to study ecology of all kinds of sorts, but there's still room in Biosphere 2 to do the kinds of experiments uh, that we're talking about here today. So I'm bringing this as an opportunity to those that are smarter than I am to figure out how the built environment experiments can actually be done again at Biosphere 2. So Biosphere 2 is because this is Biosphere 1. And it was only recently that I actually, it occurred to me that we had the copyright for Biosphere 2, but not Biosphere 1. So I went and I got the copyright for Biosphere 1. So anyway, uh, the, the idea of Biosphere 2 came from uh, experiments from these folks um, in which what they were trying to figure out is in the Earth, the way that the Earth operates itself, is through a very elegant interplay between the biological system and the inorganic system. So the atmosphere of the Earth came because of photosynthesis 2.5 billion years ago, and it's mostly controlled. Uh, the atmosphere, not today, because we people are burning all kinds of fuel, but it was mostly controlled by, by organic issues that were happening on the Earth. Okay? So these folks, um, uh, Vernatsky in particular and Folsom were the originators of an idea that was in vogue in the 80s called the Gaia Hypothesis. And uh, maybe you may remember those books about the Gaia Hypothesis in which the Earth is a living organism, basically. So, um, so the, and the other idea in order for this to be quantified in any way, what you're thinking about is all these cycles that people talk about in, in the atmospheric environment, and that is a carbon cycle and the water cycle and all these elemental cycles in which these elements move around the Earth in some way that is, is consistent. What's happening with global climate change is that all these cycles are not getting out of whack. Uh, but it, but it, for many years, for many millions of years, that was not the case. And these are some cartoons about these things. So fortunately, um, about 30 years ago, there were a group of free thinkers, in some ways probably sort of what's in this room. And these free thinkers included National Academy members uh, that were studying ecology, uh, that were studying atmospheric sciences, there were architects, there were musicians, and, and they went around the world for about two years trying to understand what today we call Earth systems. And in those days, I'm not quite sure the term was actually invented yet. And Earth systems is just, in fact, that. How does the Earth actually operate? In, and how can you understand how the ocean interacts with the atmosphere and with the Amazons and with the deserts and, and so on? Okay. So after about two or three years in which these folks were going to, um, I wish I would have been part of this because they had a boat and they used to go to, you know, visit the, the coral reefs and they went to Australia to study all kinds of things. 
But after about two or three years of this, they recognized that the only way they could really get a handle on how all of this worked was if they actually created something that looked like Biosphere 1 with various kinds of what, they, what uh, ecosystems in them that would all control it themselves uh, in a close system and they could then measure everything that was going in there. So these free thinkers then built Biosphere 2. Um, and fortunately, the person that was paying everybody, the rich person, was, is a, a, an, ar an architect. And that's probably the only reason that the biosphere still has an iconic architecture that doesn't look like a 30-year-old ruined experiment. Okay. So uh, that's, that's 1989, 1991 when the biosphere was built. And the amount of new engineering that was, that was invented to build Biosphere 2 was quite extraordinary. The airframe, uh, when it was finally finished and put together, was leaking less than the shuttle when the shuttle was actually operating. So the leakage out of the biosphere was extraordinary. The whole biosphere is, was sitting on a tub of stainless steel so that there would be no interactions between the soil and the, uh, and, and the soils inside of the biosphere. It was truly a sealed system that was supposed to recycle its water, recycle its air, and the only thing it was going to need was input, energy input. So the idea was that if you built one of these things in the moon, the only thing you would need would be a small nuclear reactor on the side to bring energy into it, but that the water would be recycled, the, 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 you wouldn't need to scrub the, the atmosphere, you wouldn't need to bring any more oxygen into the atmosphere. It was truly like the Earth. It has a couple of, of inventions that are quite extraordinary, but just to give you a sense of what this thing is today, uh, this is the rainforest. And today we're, we're finishing an experiment in the rainforest just to show you the extraordinary thing you can do in the biosphere. It's, cr it's crawling with Germans and, and Austrians and, and Swiss who got a uh, European uh, grant to study what happens to a rainforest when you dry it out and then when you rain into it again. And, and how does the carbon cycle and the water cycle and everything happen in these things? So if you go into the biosphere today, it looks like a hospital for trees. I mean, there are tubes everywhere. Uh, they're measuring every single, and, and, and of course they've been la able to label the atmosphere and they've been able to label the water that they're putting into the roots because we can measure what happens with the roots because of the stainless steel, basically. And, uh, and the experiments are gonna start showing things that cannot be measured in the outside. Uh, in, in this area here, there's an ocean where we also have um, an international experiment going on on, on the corals. Uh, and, and as all of you know, the corals are dying everywhere at an alarming rate. And the idea is whether at the biosphere, which has the biggest indoor ocean anywhere, we can build a Frankenstein coral which can then be installed in areas around the world. Because corals have a huge economic importance around the world in fisheries and in tourism. In places, the, the whole livelihood depends on corals, and as they die, that livelihood will go away. So even though there are ethical dilemmas as to whether you screw up the biodiversity of a coral, we believe that the, the structure of the coral itself is more important than that at this stage in global climate changes. So we're working on that. This is just how it, the thing was built. Um, and now a cartoon. The, the other thing that was an amazing uh, invention are these things called the lungs. They're, we have two of them, and here only one of them is shown. These, you can, you can just think about the problem. You have an enormous amount of air trapped inside of a, uh, of, of a building, which has nowhere to go as it heats up. So the, the, the problem that these folks had is that, or the worry they had, is that when, they t when the biosphere was heated up, you would blow out the windows because of the pressure of the inside the biosphere. And in the evenings when it would cool down, you'd blow the windows in by the implosion, by the lack of pressure. So what they did, oops, oh yeah. What they did is they, they connected these things which have a 20 ton aluminum plate 
there's a, there's a tunnel that goes through here, and basically when the pressure got up, the, the, the valve for that pressure would be by, move it, by increasing the volume in here. That's why they're called the lungs. Quite an elegant kind of solution. And if anybody has visited the biosphere, part of the tourism goes through one of these lungs today. These are the uh, ecosystems or biomes as they were named when, when this thing was built. Um, there was a rainforest that was put in there. There was an ocean, a marsh, which, uh, which is actually an important thing, a huge desert. And then there's this area where people lived. So from, from, here, this was, from here on, all this block was what was called a human habitat. So eight people were, were uh, basically put in here for two and a half years uh, to, to live. And of course, if they were going to survive, they needed to have intensive agriculture. So this area right here was where they were growing food. And uh, today that, that has been completely repurposed. And we have some ex very large experiments that have to do with hydrology called the Landscape Evolution Observatory. Okay. Now, um, the biosphere, which was built, as I said, 30 years ago, more or less, I, in my view, was built 30 years before its time for two reasons. One, even though we understood global climate change 30 years ago, it was hotly debated uh, issue. Um, it's still hotly debated today, but by idiots. Uh, in those days, in those days, the scientists were truly. It was just the beginning, and of course, global climate change has gone from changes that were sort of uh, small every year to now in an exponential change. So now we know everything, and in fact, we know that half of the things that we thought were gonna happen or have already happened way earlier than we thought they were gonna happen. So it's way worse than we think. But 30 years ago, there was all kinds of issues that were being discussed. Uh, and uh, so, so there was an interest in the biosphere, but it was a little bit too early to understand the importance of the biosphere as an experimental station. And the other thing that uh, is 30 years be, be, uh, before its time is that th uh, the biosphere was built before Big Brother on TV. And today, if you go to NASA, one of the big things that they're worried about is how do, they can, how do you create teams of individuals, and in particular, you know, their astronauts are all individuals, that'll work together without killing themselves or, or, or working as a team. So team uh, building for NASA is a big deal. And, now, and, and also, how do, you, how do you actually have food to, to if you're gonna have a station anywhere, how can you actually uh, grow enough food for the astronauts anywhere? Uh, and that's a big issue. That, uh, in, in microgravity, growing food is not a trivial thing. So of course now there's all kinds of people that are getting into it. So 30 years later, these are the, uh, the, the Chinese have a couple of, uh, of experimental stations in which they're trying to grow food uh, as though they would be growing food in space. And also some experiments on folks. And this is one of them. This is uh, one from NASA. It's in Hawaii. It's called High Seas. And what they built is like a big tent. This, this, folks, this person walking around in an astronaut suit, it's, it's not a real one. In other words, uh, it's just to emulate what it would be, the clunkiness of having one of these things if you're in another planet. And this thing, I think, is like 900 square feet, and they have six people in it. And, and as you may imagine, when, uh, when you have people living in a place for a long time, um, trivial things become an issue. And the director of, of, of High Seas was describing to me some of the trivial issues, such as they had a robot pet. And one day somebody got pissed off and kicked the robot pet. And it almost caused a revolution in there. So very small things become a big issue. Uh, and that's something we shouldn't forget, even in our work environment, I suspect. Am I almost done? Three minutes? OK. She's generous. Oh, sorry. Well, let me finish. Of course, the Dubaians are building something like Las Vegas on steroids. <laughs> and, uh, and Dubai, there's another one. 
and I think I can, I can just stop by, by saying the following. Uh, it stopped. Well, the experiment lasted two and a half years, and these folks had two issues. The first issue was that they not only, they were like driving a ship in addition to being farmers. So the amount of work they had to do every day was enormous. And they were terrible farmers. So in the end, they were never able to get enough caloric intake to be happy. They were able to get enough vitamins, so they didn't have scurvy or any of these diseases that you get if you don't get enough vitamins and nutrients, but they didn't get enough caloric intake. The second thing is that there was an error in the experiment, and the oxygen concentration in the biosphere dropped to about 15%, which is they were up to about 15,000 feet elevation. And uh, so between those two things, uh, these folks were really pissed off at each other. And two teams developed in about a week. And there was the white hats and the, and the black hats. There are a couple of books that are written about this, uh, and all because of the stress, small things, of how much they could eat every day, who had to cook, and so on. So the experiment uh, ended in two and a half years after it started with, a, and I'll finish with this, with the US Marshals coming in, kicking him out, and who was the person in charge of all of that? Steve Bannon, who was hired by Michael Crow, who at that point was vice president of research at Columbia University and recognized the importance of Biosphere 2 uh, to study global climate change issues. But what you have here then is a facility that can be used extensively to, to study uh, detectors of all sorts because of its scale. And in areas like the, like this, like the uh, desert, which we don't really know what to do with that, we could have experiments like those holograms that you're talking about at scale, which would be quite interesting. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry I overran that.